I'm too fast, I'm too strong, I'm too fucking good. Why was I never enough? The meatball is the person that you see at the weigh-ins, feeds from the crowd, fights for the crowd, fights for the person, fights for the underdog, fights for everyone. And then I really like doing stuff like this because this is Molly McCann. When I'm in the cage, getting hit and outmaneuvered is nothing to the life that I've had to overcome and to beat. MMA saved my life in many different ways. It's also absolutely nearly killed me as well. As long as I do what I'm supposed to do, I will be the best me and the best Molly McCann beats anyone on any given day. Whether they're struggling with drugs or alcohol or with mental health or the challenges in their life, they are the strongest people. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, and I'm thinking, how am I going to end it all? I don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with this this life that I've now attained. It took the breaking of me to make me again. Giving your best self to everything still doesn't mean you're gonna win. A win isn't a right, do you know what I mean? It's a privilege. Your opponent may well listen to this. It's an interesting dynamic that, isn't it? Weakness is in the eye of the beholder. The most bravest thing is to tell your truth and be your true authentic self. There was a time when I'd accept any form of love, even if it was rejection and hate. Well, I'm not a seat at the table, I'm the fucking table. When you forge them fire, then you are able to overcome come anything and it is my absolute superpower and I wouldn't change one day. Listen, I want to say a massive thank you to all of our new subscribers, but you know, most people that watch this content on YouTube don't subscribe. I want to change that. The more subscribers, then the more amazing we can make high performance. And I've had a lovely message actually from Rob who says, I only recently discovered the High Performance channel and I watched the full Eddie Howe and Tyson Fury interviews, both some of the best content I've seen in the last five years on YouTube. Listen, if you agree and you want to keep this amazing stuff coming for free, then hit subscribe right now. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you very much, Kang. Uh, so I believe you know how these podcasts begin. What is your version of high performance, Molly? For me, I feel like it's changed as I've got older. I feel like when I was younger, high performance would mean success by any means necessary. And um, maybe even... Um, going against my boundaries and just probably being a little bit unhealthy. Um, but I feel as the more I've got older and the more success I've gained, high performance for me means achieving success without, um, what's the word, without going against what I stand for and without, um, without crossing a boundary of mine. I feel like the order I've got, the more success I've got, there's a lot of mental health that comes into play and there's a lot of pressure and it's very hard. So I feel like if I stay true to myself, I'm able to get there now. So what do you stand for? What does Molly McCann stand for? I like to um, say equality, passion, um, community and excellence performing and walking in a state of excellence always and trying to make people smile. Well, let's go back to the beginning of this story because I think it's really important for people to understand how you got to this place now. I love the fact that the first thing you say is, you know, nothing's forever. You're constantly evolving, which is, as we all know on here, the epitome of a growth mindset. What was life like for a, a young Molly McCann? I really feel like that's where I built all of my resilience and my adversity and um, I feel like the beginning part of my life was the hardest part of my life. Growing up in the 90s, um, the recession was around. Everyone's family and friends and parents who I looked at was probably all struggling with addiction in poverty and nothing was really for certain. Um, I grew up in Liverpool. I spent a lot of time in Bournemouth as well, down south. I had um, family in both areas. And I just remember everything being hard and scary, to be honest with you. Um, scary in what way? Nothing was for certain. Um, your meals, your next meal wasn't for certain. Um, heating in the house wasn't for certain. Um, people looking after me wasn't always for certain. Um, the only thing that was certain through the whole of my upbringing was love shown to me by my family. Um, that was the only certainty, to be honest. But yeah, it was a long, hard road, I think, of a lot of 
grow f- through everyone in my family. I feel like everyone was learning on the day. And I feel like everyone was trying to break their generational cases. So tell us about about that, Molly. I mean, there's research on this done from like the University in Columbia in America that talk about the three big things that determine your life chances are in order, your parents, your postcode, and then your education. So tell us, as somebody that's broken that cycle of growing up in poverty, where your life was almost predetermined in many ways, the options available to you. Being from L11, from Norris Green, or when I was in Bournemouth, a place called Boscombe, people in those areas don't really tend to make much about themselves, do you know what I mean? And I feel like it was, I don't know, I think it was more always myself, to be honest, that got me out of where I'm from. Obviously, there was tiny little bits of opportunities which helped, but... I just remember being a kid, I'm walking into various rooms and seeing various stuff going on and just remembering I'm better than that. Like what? Um, A lot of, uh, probably alcoholism, drug addiction, um, just stuff that kids probably are never supposed to see. Do you know what I mean? Um, So if you go back there, what would you say is... Like when you think of that, what's the strongest memory that that evokes from that period? I probably think I've got one moment in my life where I've walked in to a front room and seen drug paraphernalia on the table. And I remember being about four or five and me heartbreaking because I just knew um, that wasn't supposed to be something that kids are supposed to walk in and see. And... It broke my heart because I thought my mum's relapsed and I knew how hard, I'm really sorry. It's fine. I knew how hard my mum was trying to be clean for me. I know she was trying to change her life for me. So in that moment, <clears throat> I can honestly say it was that moment where I knew I'm going to be bigger and better than this. I'm not going to repeat this and I'm going to make a change. Um, At five? Yeah, about four or five, honestly. If if you can ask anyone what was little Molly like at that age, they'll just tell you like a ball of energy. I'd always be quite scared and apprehensive first going into new situations because I really always had to scope them out. But when I got going, um, I just had this undying or belief in myself or blind faith that I could make it at something. And I just remember being in that moment thinking oh my God, I I can't, I don't want to live like this or be like this. And I think in that moment, my mum knew also and she also changed her life and turned her life around, which was the biggest cornerstone for me and showed me the way and the strength and the resilience on how to to push through. But you know, like, on attachment theory, so that's mm-hmm. off the, it, it comes from the work of a guy called Dr. John Bowlby mm-hmm. that talks around up until the age of four or five, we look to our caregivers to, to, to almost give us a sense of what the world is like and yeah. what we can expect from it. So that sounds like you're in a chaotic, turbulent period of, 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 of yeah, caregivers. So. Yeah. I'm interested, what's that taught you as an adult when you look back on it in terms of who you can rely on, how you establish a sense of calm and certainty in your world? Um, It's not been an easy journey, I can tell you that much. It's still a struggle to this day, like, because there'll be bits of PTSD, lots of trauma, and I think if I had to, when I realise why things unravel for me now, um, well, over the last few years, it will always come down to the pathways when I was little, well, it wasn't explained. This is how, when you're frustrated and when you're scared, this is how you you vent it and this is how you talk about it. Or um, it was quite tough, to be honest. But what what I did see is, just to to finish on that, is my mum did always show me that there was always stability in the end. Do you know what I mean? And she was able to show me that Um, mistakes can happen or life isn't always going to treat you easy and life's not always going to be okay but you will find a way to make it through so what triggers you now that you can identify was what the seeds of that were planted when you were just a young adolescent um i feel as if i've got older i realized i had a lot of abandonment stuff um 
and a lot of just wanting to be loved and to be liked. I couldn't understand why why all that stuff was happening. Now, when, when I was 15, 16, me and my mum had lots of conversations, open and honest, and she explained lots of things and addictions and a, di- a disease. The, the, the people in my life didn't choose to do this on purpose. It wasn't like, oh, hang on, let's just put Molly in these kinds of situations. Far from that, do you know what I mean? So it was a lot of understanding that why was I never enough? And to be honest... It has completely fueled me to be the person that I am and to give me the drive and the resilience, like I say. When I'm in the cage, getting hit and outmaneuvered by a, a submission attempt or by a strike is nothing to the life that I've had to overcome and to beat. Do you know what I mean? And this is such a common theme on high performance. And look, thank you for coming on and you know being so open and sharing that. You know, We have so many people that come on and talk about Trauma leads to triumph. Mm-hmm. You know, we had a Dame Stephanie Shirley who was an immigrant who came to the UK escaping Nazi persecution. And she said that it's in exactly the same way that you do. She said, once you've been an immigrant, once you've had a change of life and a change of parents and a change of country at five years old with no control over anything, she said, you get this feeling of invincibility that you will then take risks. Yeah. You will then do things that no one else does. There's a reason why... of the biggest businesses in America are owned by first or second generation immigrants. It's a hard thing, but for people who, you know, are currently going through trauma or are at a stage further back than you, what would you want to share with them about the the story of this can feel like the most painful thing in the world and it absolutely is and needs to be dealt with, but then at the same time can become your superpower? Like, how do they get to where you are now, do you think? That's a, that's a really good question. I feel like being able to speak to people, um, if you can speak to someone who you trust and they're able to to help guide you, then take it as early as you can. I feel like our generation, my generation now and the generation before me seek therapy and seek help where, I don't know, the generation before that, like my mum's generation that may have being seen as a weakness and sometimes culture, culturally where I'm from um, and possibly where you're from, it's the the men and, and the women are supposed, are supposed to be strong, you're not supposed to moan, you're not supposed to speak about feeling feelings but I feel like that's something that we have to overcome and be a bit more honest about but I feel like when you forge them fire then you are able to, to overcome anything and um, it is my biggest superpower, I think, what I went through. And, and what I do say, because I know this will probably quite be quite triggering for my mum to hear and for other listeners and viewers to see, um, it is my absolute superpower. And I wouldn't change one day. I wouldn't change one footstep of my journey or of my mum's journey um, because we've had to own our stuff. Mm. Do you know what I mean? My shame isn't isn't her shame and her shame isn't my shame. And um, I don't know, I said to my mum once and, and she said to me, she got quite upset because it obviously, like I say, it's triggering for her to hear because sometimes she sees it as her disadvantage and like she's let me down in certain ways, but I don't see it like that because I feel like she's made the strongest person that co- she could have ever made. But I said to her, our story may save other people's lives and yeah. that's why we need to talk about it Absolutely. because it is like I'll probably go home from this like probably quite drained and really open because I'm opening myself up to I don't know to a broader audience you know what I mean but sometimes no one really will know this about me well the people close around me will know but a lot of people on the like I say the broader scale will never have a clue they'll just think Oh, the the elbow girl or the girl who likes a bevy after a fight, but no one knows the hardships I'd have had to overcome. Can I ask you about the importance of empathy as well? We were joined on the show by Joe Wicks, who shared with us that his dad was also an addict. And exactly like you, as a kid, he used to think, am I not good enough to keep you away from the drugs? Like, am I not enough? And it's only now that he looks back and he realises, as you do as well, that it was an illness. This Mm -hmm. isn't this isn't the something that you could have cured because the person was ill. Mm-hmm. And I think from the outside, people that have no experience of the world that you've had, they look at drug abusers and think wasters, losers, junkies, all of that sort of stuff. What message would you want to give to people about the, the, the things that you saw so that we can have more empathy for yeah. people who are struggling like your mum was? 
I feel like growing up within the NA community, because obviously my mum's a part of Narcotics Anonymous, I was known as an NA baby. So when they had meetings and they went and, and done the shares and worked the 12-step programme, I was there because we're talking about the 90s when people didn't have money for um, people to look after the kids and uh, childcare, sorry. So I'd have to go and sometimes I'd have to listen and sometimes people were lovely enough to my mum to take me to the park for an hour so she could have a moment and she could work the programme. But I, um, we was always, always taught to not judge anyone else because you don't know what that person's been through and I think that's really important that you don't pass judgment and I remember I was in a music video with Joel Corey and Tom Grennan not so long ago called Lionheart and it was in some way I think it was like Berkshire or Shropshire or some shire, some shire, <laughs> should I say, posh some way posh. And I remember getting picked up in London. I got picked up in this big Mercedes car, and I'm like, oh my god! And I'm on my way to Warner Brothers. And as we're driving through uh, this area, I remember ringing. I'm not sure if it was my fiance Ellis. And I remember thinking, these people who live here probably really think that people who were on benefits and addicts and things really are just like like. They're just making it up like it's not real. Like if, if people only think this is the real way of life, then they are obviously going to think that's not real. Do you know what I mean? Because they're so blindsided mm. to reality. They've never walked a day in the shoes of someone who has grew up um, to their parents being a sex worker and they've probably been orphaned or the parents died from a, an overdose and then they've had to bring themselves up and they've never been able to understand how to even enrol in school, enrol in college, get a job. Like, people aren't... The system's not made for people to flourish, do you know what I mean? So we have to be really accepting and understanding to that and give... Hold out olive branches and we have to, to give everyone a chance because where I'm from, you only need to give people a chance sometimes and, and that's all they want. They'll make it off their own back. They're not asking for money they're not asking for you to do the work for them they're just asking for an opportunity uh, can i what, just pick up on one quick point on that i also think there's a whole conversation where the narrative needs to change around if someone's got mental health problems oh they're weak they've got a mental health issue if someone takes drugs oh they're weak because they can't stay off the drugs if someone's an alcoholic oh they're weak these people whether they're struggling with drugs or alcohol or with mental health or the challenges in their life they are the strongest people because they're still trying to be a parent trying to be a friend trying to live a life you know your mum would have had to show so much strength to try and go forward I, I loved it what you said when almost like the biggest thing for you was her showing you in the end how much she loved you because she changed her whole life yeah, for my, you could you tell yeah. us what she did my mum's my my words I got so emotional speaking about this because it means so so much to me. Do people. you think it's a good thing though? Like, if you can imagine seeing your parents, the the person who keeps you safe, your guardian, the person whose love means everything to you, yeah, on the knees struggling with this, like, I, I could I could just see how how much it was affecting her because she's not just struggling with withdrawal symptoms and having to chase the next fix. She's struggling with the feeling of letting her child down, her blood, her flesh, the thing that she wants to to prosper and to flourish. So for me to see my mum get clean, she moved us to Bournemouth. She started a new life down there. She went to, she got clean on her own. So she's done it all by herself. Normally people have to go into rehabs, have to go into recovery, into dry houses and do all that. She tried that and um, and it didn't work. She relapsed, so then she'd done it on her own. And to watch someone do that by themselves is extraordinary. Um, she took herself back to college, so she got all of her... I'm not sure what qualifications she didn't have, but she got all the qualifications she did have. Um, she had two jobs. She worked in a chip shop and she was chamber maiden, so she was uh, working in hotels, doing anything that she could. She would um, also volunteer at the non-profitable organisation. She's a director of now called Street Scene and she do the night shifts. So it's a... Um, 
residential rehabilitation centres so she'd sleep overnight and just watch the clients and make sure that they wasn't doing anything that they shouldn't be doing so in this moment of me being 8, 9, 10 and 11 and watching the person who I adore and I love the most absolutely change their life around I see my mum get clean get qualifications and then get a job as a um, counsellor so she then started teaching people what not to do and um, like monkey see monkey doesn't need to do do you know what I mean and she's really flourished and she really flourished there see there's something really powerful about that because that's like a real life uh, interpretation of there's a model from a guy called Kurt Lewin that talks about behavior is a is, is a function of both personality but also about our environment and I wonder how much of your mum's addiction was stitched into the environment of growing up in L11, you know, Absolutely. and being around that and mm -hmm. the power of having the courage to step away from that environment suddenly shifts mm -hmm. the behaviour, you know, her personality, then she threw it into hard work and being the great mum that she evidently became. She said, yeah, she's done a good job at leading in the end, do you know what I mean? Um, it's funny, me and my mum have never had an argument where I've said to her, like, I hate you and I've never once thrown in her face anything or any adversity that we've had to go through together because ultimately when the shit hits the fan, Sharon, it's my mum who's the one who leads everyone out of the flames, do you know what I mean? So so I'm interested in, there's an awful lot of wisdom contained in any of these addiction therapies, you know. Mm -hmm. We spoke to Matt Fraser, the five times world CrossFit champion mm -hmm. that quoted the serenity prayer yeah, before that's... we stepped onto the mat. Mm -hmm. You know, the first step of recovery is knowing what you can control, mm -hmm. understanding what you can't and having the grace to, and the wisdom to know the difference. What what did you learn by almost by osmosis of being yeah. part of those meetings that you think actually had a significant effect on your journey to where you are today? I've never been asked that. Also, I don't think I've ever been this honest, so I well, probably wouldn't have been asked this question, but I really learned that it's okay not to be okay. I really learned that there's always, the, the rain always ends and the, uh, the sunshine does come. Do you know what I mean? Like, when you sit there and you listen to someone share, I remember coming to, to CA, Cocaine Anonymous, they had the first ever women's convention in London and my mum said, do you want to come and support the people coming over to, to make their shares? And I was like, absolutely. And I remember even then still being um, 20 and 21, still listening to these shares and taking so much from it. Um, but I just seen that there was a certain power in being vulnerable um, and these women like if I thought my life was fucked I'm sorry to swear but what they've managed to overcome I was like oh my god and, um, and I think it really gave me just always hope that you can always overcome and there's always a way and you just have to talk about it and work through it you know what I mean and um, I, I, I did learn that as a younger, younger child as well. And if you're happy to sort of continue on the theme of being vulnerable, which mm. is, as you yeah, know, you I listen. think I was going to digress back to that, but I should have said the the greatest gift that I learned was being vulnerable because you become an oversharer. Because when you're sitting in a room, um, you you're safe to to speak and to tell your truth, and I think that's what I learned. Vulner vulnerability was my superpower as well. I've got a few, I think. <laughs> well, let's talk about the vulnerability superpower. Mm -hmm. Because you, we can only have a conversation like this if we're totally honest and everything is mm -hmm. open for people, if you're happy to do that, which yeah. I think... That's is, what I'm here for, is, isn't it? Absolutely. So it's easy for people to go, oh, I see, struggles as a child, gets into sport, and then everything's fine. But <laughs> let's be totally honest that that's <laughs> not the way the world works. Absolutely not, no. Would you be happy to share with us, despite the fact that, you know, you're now fighting on the world stage mm -hmm. in the biggest arenas mm -hmm. with some of the most famous knockouts in UFC history, whether there are still challenges, if they are, how do they manifest themselves and how do you deal with them? Yeah, I feel like it's been a bit of a whirlwind because probably something that's attached itself to me since growing up would be I'm not enough. And then when you get to the world stage, 
I'm still not enough. Do you know what I mean? So I've got to the UFC and I'm still fighting my own battles and my own demons in my head thinking, like, should it be here? Like, I remember walking out at UFC Liverpool and I'm like, oh my God, first scouser to make the walk. And as I'm walking, I'm taking it all in. And I still don't even believe that I deserve to be there because why should someone from where I'm from be there when ultimately... <clears throat> my record, my fight style, my personality and how much I can sell a ticket and how much I can punch someone's head in. Yeah, I should be there, do you know what I mean? But I remember that was always, and it's only just fading that little bit of um, of self-doubt of should I be there, but I suppose the imposter syndrome is obviously a big one that I don't think a lot of athletes are candid enough and brave enough to speak about. Um, but I feel like that's something that I will always probably struggle with just a little bit. Um, and I think that comes from people might not think that I'm very humble who don't know me on a one-to-one -one basis. But I think when you are humble, sometimes you don't want to accept it all or don't think you deserve it all when you do. So I think that's something that will be ongoing for me to always have to deal with and just get to grips with because the worst thing I think I could be would be like a big head and have an overinflated ego and I'm very aware of myself and what I need and what I want and I don't want or I don't want to have to need the um the affirmation of other people or for people to want to have pictures with me or for people to want to, oh, there's Meatball. I don't want that to become a part of myself. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think that's really important because when you lose sight of what the goal is, the goal is to be successful, to be a world champion and to provide for myself and for the future um, coming through and provide that blueprint, I don't want to actually be that person that's quite narcissistic and requires that side of the fame and the glory. Which is a difficult, it's a difficult balance in that, isn't it? Because yeah, I'm spinning plates every day to be fair. Yeah, no, I can imagine. I mean, so I grew up in boxing and I always used to think that there's a sweet spot in your career that when you first start, you're humble, you're hardworking, you listen mm -hmm. to the right people around you. And then the more you progress and the more successful you are, the more your name and your, and your uh, your fame mm -hmm. is it attracts a gravitational pull to lots mm -hmm. of hangers on, lots of people that wouldn't be associated with you, people Absolutely. that wouldn't be patting you on the back, and that's difficult not to be seduced by that if mm -hmm. you've never had it before. You know, you spoke about your attachment issues yeah. of wanting to be loved, wanting to yeah. be recognised. So you're getting it, but not always from the healthier from the sources. Right people, yeah. How so? There's that famous Angelo Dundee quote that look around your dressing room when you've got beat rather than when you've won to find out who really matters. Mm -hmm. How do you determine that without having to go through defeats or go through disappointments? I feel like there was a part of my career where I seen very much who was coming at me for the wrong reasons. And I it took me a couple of months of realising going out to party and, and that those people were for that. And they wasn't there for the right reasons, do you know what I mean? But what I will say was the positive about having all of this is being involved in MMA where the UFC is 30 years old. We don't have the regulations and the procedures in place to guide you through these moments. It's very much in boxing and in MMA. We are at the mercy of the public and we have to drag ourselves up. And the one thing that I like about this whole process is it's taught me to be more of a role model it like it's like I've grown up in front of the public and I know that the celebrations after fights probably aren't that um aren't that great do you know what I mean but the working class people love it to be fair and everyone I grew up with loves it but I don't know I feel like it's brought a better Molly McCann and a more well-rounded Molly McCann and a more switched on Molly McCann because being that kid who's had to grow up in the madness, I've adapted it like quick. Do you know what I mean? So that's been the positive part. But um, the negative part was it's probably cost me relationships. It's probably cost me weeks and months of my own brain having to work out 
agendas when i sit down in a room what is your agenda your two agenda right now in this interview is to get the best interview out of me that you can and i don't know if they say if i broke down they probably would be but would they be after care when i leave do you know what i mean would you be looking after me um you're very firm and straight with your questions and you've got answers out to me which I've never given before um, but I trust you do you know what I mean and I know that the podcast is for good and I am aware of who you are so that's why you are getting it but sometimes being in rooms with those kinds of people oh no those kinds of people but being in rooms with people I've never met before and they're coming at me with positive stuff like oh well we'll offer you this and we'll offer you that and sometimes I'm not doing me due diligence on who they are and what they're about and I've had to learn that kind of stuff yeah. also. So what's the biggest lesson you've learned then? What my boundaries truly are, and this has happened, I'd literally say, in the last... I had a bit of a breakdown last year because it all got on top. It was like I was literally dropped in the ocean and it just engulfed me because the performances were going a certain way, the sponsors was coming in, people was seeing a normal person do well and everyone championed that, so it was really hard to not let people down do you know what I mean so it was really hard to have to deal with that uh, how difficult was that because like you know right at the very beginning you decided at four years old I'm not going to be like this I'm going to forge my own path and then we can talk in due course about the hurdles you had to overcome mm -hmm. just to be in the octagon be, yeah then it finally happens the money the fame the recognition the success the belts oh, the celebrations yeah. right and that that you dreamt of all your life mm -hmm. leads to a breakdown. Yeah. How hard is is that to compute? Imagine everything that you've ever dreamed of, kind of achieving it, and then being the most unhappy in yourself that you've ever been. And you will have heard this a million times, I imagine, with the guests that you've had on. But well, Tyson Fury described it as the paradise syndrome. Yeah. You've spent your whole career and the whole best part of 15, 16 years of my life trying to attain this... I feel like from being a kid, what was my goals? My goals was to buy a house, to um, get a degree, to get engaged and get married, to win a world title in Liverpool and um, and to be in the UFC. Do you know what I mean? So these are all my goals. So I'm gently ticking my way off. Um, and then I get there and I've never been more empty in my whole life than when I get there. Nothing had a feeling, nothing made me happy because everything came to me in abundance. And even though, don't get me wrong, when I got a six-figure sponsorship deal, I was crying my eyes out. And when I was being presented with all these big, big moments in my life, for a second, I'd cry and be overwhelmed because why did I deserve this? I, it's obviously always going to keep coming back to well, I don't deserve this, why have I got this, do you know what I mean? So my head's trying to add up all this stuff, but when it comes to you all at once, like I say, things just don't mean the same anymore. And um, and I had to have big sit-downs. It's the first time I've had to ask for help, to be honest. I've always been able to manage to get through anything. And I broke down to was my that, fiance. Was that a tricky admission for you? No. You were okay with that? I was cool with asking for help because um, I don't see what's wrong with asking for help. Do you know what I mean? If I was in a classroom and I couldn't spell, Miss, can you help me with that? Or um, even to now, me and Ellis are trying to write an email. Ellis, I can't really spell and, and format this correctly. Can you make me sound smarter? Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm I'm all day on that. Um, but it's the first time I've had to ring my mum up and go, you're going to have to come to Liverpool. Um, I'm not in a good way not in a good place and um, I remember we just had to sit down like me, my mum and my fiance and I was at this place where I was having thoughts and dreams. I remember having a dream a couple of times back to back and it was about how I was going to do myself in, so which vice would I take, how how was it going to be and I remember we, and this is like after the second elbow so this was after three big wins in the UFC I'd won 50 grand bonuses after every one of them I'd got all this sponsorship I was in the best place in my life on paper and I just was in a, in a state where 
I was shaking every day. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. And I'm thinking, how am I going to end it all? Because I'm not, I don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with this life that I've now attained. So it took like, it took the breaking of me to obviously make me again. And I just remembered that my mum came and it was harder to see the effect that I was having on my fiancé than that was the hardest part because you're coming home or your partner's coming home every day to see you in the worst state ever and just not you, not the, the Molly that you was when you first met this person. And um, I think it was really hard just to see how it was affecting her and I felt even more guilty because of that. So um, my mum just came, sat me down and we just had to work through it. And I just remember saying, after this next fight, if I feel like this still, I can't fight anymore because you've gone from being someone who's a people pleaser, who just wants to make people who come into your um, space feel better when they leave. But if you imagine walking through my amazing city or walking through this country or walking through Ireland, everyone who I meet, I'm given a piece of my pie to. At the end of the day, I had got nothing left and I'm I'm just I was running off fumes for months and um and it just come on top in the end, do you know what I mean? And I remember I reached out to a guy called Martin Bone in the end, who was a a wellness and a meditation coach. And I just remember <clears throat> going to speak to him and I was like on my knees and I was just like, I don't know if I'm gonna make it out of this. And it was that bad. It was that bad, yeah. And I remember I sat down with him for about three hours on two different occasions and he just let me speak. He just let me page like I was just crying and I could, was uncontrollable. And he just said to me, like, your central nervous system is finished. He said, you've just been fight or flight for so long and you're trying to give everyone. You don't want to let anyone down. And you just want to be the best person that you can be. And you want to let everyone come on this journey with you, Molly. But that's not the case. Like, you're not going to be able to carry on doing this. And I was like, you're right, yeah. Like, I can't, like, I can't do anymore, can I? And it took a lot. I mean, I got a fight to fight an MSG, the mecca of, of fighting. And I was like, right, I've got 12 weeks here to get myself right. And I don't know how to say no. I only know how to overcome. And I mean, I've been in fight camps where my stepdad's like um, got a terminal illness. I'm nursing him as well as training, as well as working full time, as well as looking after my mum. Molly McCann knows how to overcome. I can do this. And I worked so hard every day meticulously. I gave my social media up for five months. I was going to swear then, effed it off, gave it away, gave me passwords to my manager. He rang me up and he went, I rang him up actually and I said, I'm not okay. He said, well, I'm here to lighten the loads. He said, you've never let me do this for you. Um, I do it for Paddy. I always have because he's just, he's just let me from the beginning, but you've always had a tight hold on your career. Let me take the weight off so he's like I'm going to sort all your accounts I'm going to do this I'm going to do that I'm going to do the other give me your social media you're not going back on that and I felt free the moment that went by the way I was like Woof. I remember that weekend my mum minded the dogs me and my Ellis my fiance we went to the lakes and I went to this spa called Lador Falls and uh, Martin had given me all this homework to do and he's like right we're going to go back to basics and we're going to start you fresh on it. It just honestly it involved every day checking in, waking up, doing breath work, meditating. Nothing too stimulating in my life. Literally just like wake up, gratitude journal, write me goals, write me intentions, um, walk to the gym, put me music on, do what I was made to do, go and train, go and be the best version of myself, come home, meditate, do lots of savasana, try and calm myself and just slow life right down. And it was, I'd say, come the fight when it was three or four months and it was time to fight in New York in November, just gone. I was ready. I was the best me. I was bulletproof. I was in here. I was like ready to go. But um, honestly, it took me to go to hell and back. And yeah, I didn't think that there was moments of getting through it. But like I say, 
I mean, did. There's two things that jump out to me there in your answer, and thanks for being so candid. The first one is what I understand is the first step of going back to addiction therapy, which mm -hmm. is surrender. Yeah. Eventually, we have to accept I'm powerless in the face of this, and mm -hmm. that sounds like what you did eventually. Mm -hmm. But then what really is fascinating is everything you described that you did next was all small, achievable, replicable steps, you know, get up in the morning, journal, mm -hmm. do some breath work, listen to music. There was nothing outside of your control that you could do, and it was like the cumulative scaffolding of those small steps that eventually took you to the successful outcome. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I had to get my foundations right again. Do you know what I mean? I think, I don't know, the foundations didn't mix right. We we bought a cowboy, do you know what I mean, to come and fix the, the foundation. So we had to rip it all up, start fresh and build the foundations right and get the house right. But my mum said something to Ellis in that time because if you can imagine, it wasn't overnight and it kept on and it would creep back in and I had to not stuff it down. I had to like let it surface, breathe if it resonates in it and then you can go again. But my mum said something to Ellis one day and, and she said, um, doesn't matter if Molly's on her knees, I've seen her worse than this and she will get through it. Don't worry, she will get through this. And my mum didn't baby me through it. Sharon Leonard didn't baby me through it. She allowed me the space to, I'm here, I'll stay here. I'm going to show you, look, just this, this, this and this. And she also mirrored what Martin was saying. She was also sceptical, like, I don't know if I trust this person. You're very vulnerable right now and not a vulnerable in a good in a good way. You're, like, scary vulnerable. And, um, and she like she overseen it and she's like yeah that's okay and she was like right I'm going to go now and you're going to overcome this and you're going to win so. so your mum sounds like she's almost like the perfect corner man you know like for a she, boxing or a fight do you fight. know when it's fight week and when I'm about to fight someone she's not allowed to come anymore because her insecurities would surface and I could see oh, them right. like a tick do you know what I mean I'd be like hey I haven't got time for that <laughs> right now so she gives me these little voice notes and these little messages and through what she has grown through, what she has gone through, and she has become um, the best person and the best teacher for me to learn from. And in these moments when I was really, really mentally unwell, um, I went to have some Reiki healing, and um, and the woman was speaking to me, and she was like, "Do you know your mum?" And I hadn't spoke about anything like this. She was like, "Your mother is your greatest teacher. Before she leaves this earth, you must take from her everything that you can." What's so, the greatest lesson she's taught you? She just said, "I'm cut from her cloth." Do you know what I mean? I'm cut from Sharon Leonard's cloth, and I, I were, I, I can see how strong my mum's been, and nothing has defeated my mum. And I think more has hit me mum than has maybe hit me. Do you know what I mean? But she's just shown me that she's the beacon of light and she's she's able to change her lives. She's changed and saved so many other people's lives that as long as I now follow the end product, <laughs> do you know what I mean? The, the blueprint um, since recovery and post-recovery um, that I am, I can do anything that I want to do. And I don't know, she's just made me since I was little mal. I was she used to call me a cave baby because I was like undiagnosed with ADHD, just this mental loose cannon, do you know what I mean? And she'd like pull a hair out because imagine trying to control a child who's probably been through that much shit growing up. My mum didn't understand like what's wrong with Molly and it was all the hyper focus, the the hyperactivity. My mum just didn't know how to deal, but she did in the end and I'm proud of myself and I'm proud of the woman that she's raised. Can we talk about the power of journaling? Absolutely we can because we can sell some of your journals. <laughs> well, uh, 365 yeah. ways to become your best yeah. high performance journal. No, no, that's I not the reason one, for mentioning the way, it. Good, yeah. I'm glad you do. I think that it's still something that particularly here in the UK we're a bit sniffy or a bit cynical about it. We can't really believe that, you know, fighting on the world stage someone that does what you do which is effectively you know punch someone in the head until they can't yeah. fight any longer um <laughs> is what you do for a living how on earth can writing down your feelings get you to be more elite in that sense would you be happy to share with us a few of the lines that you write regularly that have the biggest impact for you that 
I think will be really helpful for people to hear yeah. and why for you it does work. Yeah, so, uh, so I'll say since I was five, six or seven, since my mum ever truly got clean, when we was, ve well, when I was young, we'd go on our knees next to the bed every night and we'd say our prayer, we'd say the serenity prayer and then she'd ask me three things that I'm grateful for and then she'd say, what are your goals? So since I was this She big, sounds like a great mum, by the way. But I, like, I know, but I mean, we're raw, or we yeah. were raw back then. This, like, it, I don't know, it was just like, it was just a feeling. It wasn't something that you wrote down. It wasn't something that you read. It's just what my mum felt, do you yeah. know what I mean? And she passed it on. And she used to tell me about short-term and long-term goals when I was this big. And my mum wasn't educated until she was in her 30s, do you know Where's what I mean? Where's that come from for her then? I've never asked that. I don't know. I don't know if it's... I think it's the 12-step programme. Yeah. I think it's the higher purpose. I think it's the universe. And I think it's just her relationship with God and um, and the universe. Do you know what I mean? It, the 12-step programme is all about, I don't know, spirituality and your relationship with the higher power, however you wish to voice that and, and communicate to that. Do you know what I mean? But... I start mine with a mantra and because I'm ill and quite emotional I might forget it now but it normally starts with dear universe and God I'm so thankful um, for and then um, I go into what my actual mantra is sorry that's the opening to it and it goes I'm too fast I'm too strong I'm too fucking good I'm powerful beyond measure I'm successful beyond belief and anyone's life I touch, I change. So I tried to write a mantra that would mean really me as a person. It puts me all together. So I have to tell myself before a fight, as I'm about to walk out, someone's trained every day of their life to come and put me away. And they're not going to, not today. So I'm too fast. I'm too strong. I am too fucking good. I am powerful and successful beyond measure. Do you know what I mean? I have to, I have to put the armor on on my head before I even get there. So the negative thoughts and the negative doubts every morning doesn't even come past this. And then I feel like it probably comes back to the abandonment stuff. But I never want people to feel like how I felt in certain circumstances when I grew up. So when one person comes into my path, if I can give them a compliment, if I can add to their day and they feel better after leaving me, then I will have changed their life just that little bit that day. So then after that, I normally write... Um, I used to write this in a different way. So I used to write how the secret and how the power would have you write this. You'd write your, your goals and then your intentions, whereas I write a contract to myself. So every goal is mixed into an intention. Shout out to Tom Smith, someone who helped me write it this way. So he said, you've got to write it like a, a movie scene, like a script. So okay. I remember... I wrote, it's funny, first six months I wrote the same five goals every day and they've all come true exactly how I wrote them. What were they? Um, I was going to win a fight against um, Kim and I was going to get a 50 grand bonus. I was going to get a six-figure deal sponsorship. I was going to gain a, what else, a punditry job. And I can't remember what the last one is, but I know you've watched a video of something oh, yeah, planned yeah, yeah. before and in the book that I've read the script of that it's all in there but I'll take a picture of it and show you um, but I remember um, for argument's sake one was on September 4th you're going to walk out in, New in Las Vegas and you're going to steal the show you're going to completely obliterate your opponent to the, to the point where she doesn't want to hit back you're going to have everyone in the arena screaming your name. Dana White's going to absolutely fall in love with you. You will gain a new four-fight contract and you'll gain fight to the night bonus. Um, thank you, universe. It's already done. And I put the date in which that the, the goal should be completed by and then I put a tick next to it. So every day I sign my name and put a tick against it so that I hold myself accountable to those goals and dreams because... If you don't hold yourself accountable to your vision, then it's easy to just steer off course. Now, I can already hear 
gestalt therapists around the country listening to <laughs> what you've just described and sort of sitting up and going what a brilliant example of mm -hmm. gestalt therapy often says that our, our that our inner world has to correlate with our outer world so like in a really silly like silly way if you you know if you see a crooked picture frame and you're somebody that likes order you have to balance mm -hmm. it regardless of the discomfort it causes it's too uncomfortable not to do it and I'm interested in terms of how does that make you feel writing down such really quite vivid technical goals like that, that you go and do tick every day mm -hmm. and that contract with yourself is really powerful. Tell yeah. us what that does in terms of changing your everyday habits, your everyday behaviours. I feel like someone who has ADHD that you require routine and you work best from routine. And I feel like from being a young child to being an adult, if I'm feeling a bit off key or uncensored or not happy, it's because I'm not following the routine and the things that make me happy. So when I wake up, you've got to understand training five Olympic disciplines or four Olympic disciplines every day with males, not with females, and living the life. I mean, I lived the life. I wasn't gifted with the the best physique or the best somatotype and frame to be doing what I'm doing. So a large proportion of my success relies on resilience and heart and just, I have to beat you, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So um, to make sure that I'm always accountable to myself and to my goals makes me feel better. When I write that, when I hit camp, I'm a completely different person in here straight away. Like, I am happy when I am not living in abundance and I don't know why, do you know what I mean? I don't know if it's from being younger, feeling love for the first time and safe for the first time. I'm not sure if it's because we didn't have anything and I was, I'm feeling like that again or if to be the best version of myself and to have the best performance of my life, I feel that you must always be feeling in the negative, in the the deficit and you shouldn't always be feeling great because that's what fighting is. But I know when I write those things down that by the time I get to the gym, my mind's geared, my mind's warmed up. So when you get into our gym and I'm about to hit pads, it's a, it's completely strate strategic. It's movement patterns. I've got to follow that pattern for this fight to probably work. I need to know in my mind I am the best in the world. And sometimes if I'm not, I have to fake it till I make it. So that's a real big reason why I think it's important for me to do that. And even if I take it back to previous um, previous question, you said, why do I feel why was I feeling better than myself when I was at my lowest? It's because I am doing the little things right. I'm consistently adding up them 1% every day and I'm controlling my controllables. When I can't control the external factors, what people think of me, what people write about me, what people say about me or what my opponent's doing, that's none of my business. I can't control that. And I spend too much time dipping my toe in that. Do you know what I mean? I spend too much time thinking, oh, what if my opponent's doing that? Oh, she's training that way. Oh, she's from Brazil. Oh, I'm only from Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. Like, a load of, like, BS, that doesn't matter. As long as I do what I'm supposed to do, I will be the best me and the best Molly McCann beats anyone on any given day. So people who are struggling with that bit of self-doubt, and you've mm -hmm. said, you know, you have imposter syndrome as you're walking out to fight someone or as you're mm -hmm. preparing to fight someone, people who have these doubts, what you're saying is, the process sort of kills the doubt. It's like that might be there, but mm -hmm. my hard work, my work ethic, my attention to detail, my non-negotiables, my one percents, mm -hmm. that's sort of the fire is extinguished by that. Is that was that what you're saying? I love that analogy, Jake. Um I absolutely believe what you're right what you're saying is right there. I think when you leave no stone unturned, no matter how a fight for me goes. I'll leave with my head up. The last fight that I completely got my ass handed to me, the girl got her game plan off before I did. And in my game, that's how it goes. If you get your game plan off first, you win. If you don't, you lose. The second that fight was over, congratulated her because I did never think she was going to do that to me. I left with my head held high and I went and met everyone else in the pub, as I do. I met everyone in the Irish bar, Jack Doyle's, and I sat there... And I could sit with myself. Now I've lost before, 
I've I've lost one other time on my UFC debut. I could not sit with myself. I had never felt anything like that before. But I knew I had given everything. I had paid for every single thing I could in terms of recovery to get my body right. I hadn't even had a cookie in camp. Do you know what I mean? Like I mean, I hadn't I hadn't come off the diet at all. I had gone fifteen weeks without an alcoholic be- alcoholic beverage. I hadn't even gone to watch Everton Football Club play. Do you know what I mean? Which is like the harshest reality of life right now for <laughs> anyone um, in Liverpool. Like, um, I had given up, not gone. I had just I'd done everything right. And in the moments, even you, in your biggest defeats, I walked in, I could walk with my head held high. Don't get me wrong, I grieved. Like, it was no one's business. And I had to still sit and think, is this for me? Should, should I be doing this? But I think... If you're not sad and if you're not feeling like that and if you're not heartbroken after losing, you shouldn't be in the game. Um, What's your process for being a better fighter after a defeat? Win or lose, what's the blessing in the lesson? So every lesson you go find your blessing. And when I win, there's been times where I've had more financial gain and financial blessings where I'm going into board meetings I'm elevating in an academic team and in business mind in the business world and sometimes when I win I can I'm now in the I can go and train and better my skill set and have the money behind me to go anywhere in the world and train with anyone who I want to do who I want to train with and sometimes I've learnt more from a win sometimes than I have from a loss and I think sometimes in a loss you become so self-critical, I think, and that's a really important thing. Like, what are you learning from this moment? And um, what I learned, especially in the last fight, is hard work and an application of, like, goodwill and and giving your best self to everything still doesn't mean you're going to win. Like, a win isn't a right. Do you know what I mean? It's a privilege, and sometimes you're just privileged to get that win on the day. And I feel like in that last loss, because I'd applied myself so well... I didn't have to reassess anything really, do you know what I mean? Because I'd done everything to the best of my ability and I don't have to think. Do you know how many people said to me, well, you need to change gyms? Now I do not need to change gyms. See, I was going to ask you on that because, Mm -hmm. again, this used to frustrate me when I was growing up and you'd see fighters and they'd take the shortcuts, Mm -hmm. right, and then they'd get beat and rather than do that self-analysis of go, I took a shortcut there and that's why I got beat. They'd go, yeah. oh, it's the coach's fault. It's the gym's fault. It's And it was easier to point the finger at others than do that self-analysis and be honest with themselves. Yeah. And so what advice would you give to anyone that knows that they're making excuses or but doesn't want to look in the mirror and do that reflection that you've just described? I feel like having an honest team around you, um, when I've lost in certain ways my coaches have said that's my fault I should have done that or I should have done this or I should have done that and they grieve the loss with me like they grieve it with me and I've said the loss is my fault I'm the person in the cage and I made the decision that ultimately cost me the fight you if we've game plans incorrectly it's up to me to be able to think on the spot and change the game plan so I learned that and I think I held them accountable to to themselves where no actually you don't have to put the you don't have to make me feel better about myself. It was my shit, I done it wrong. Do you know what I mean? But I feel like to those who know that they're dancing with the devil a little bit, keep the right people around you who aren't yes men. If you look at me and Paddy Pimbley, we have the same people in our corner who have always been there because they're the ones who have sat me down in camps when I believe I'm given everything. And I mean, everything. I had my coach sit me down maybe three camps ago and literally say, I had just had my ass handed to me in a fight simulation with a lad who fights 10 pounds heavier than me. He's probably one of the best in Europe. And he's gone, that's not good enough, is it, Molly? I went, are you messing with him? Are you joking? Like, I'm crying, like, I'm trying everything. He went, you know, you know. And I went home fuming with him, Paul Rimmer, fuming with him, because I know he knows I don't take shortcuts. I've never done yeah, it, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I went home and I went, I went in my head. Sorry for swearing again, because Ellis will go mad. I went, I'll fucking show you. So I went home. 
my fucking show on him. And then that was obviously the fight in... Um, I had a, a big free fight win streak and that was the first win. So I had to fight against the girl called Kim who had 10 inches reach on me. And um, yeah, and I suppose that was probably the little golden nugget and pearl of wisdom of that camp that may have changed everything. But if you don't have these people keeping you honest, friggin' I'll have my fiancé every day who puts it on my toes, do you know what I mean? I have friends and family who I am the bottom of the list when it turns that I get annihilated and ripped to death at any family function, any event. I'm not like... I try to be the big mouth and the joker, but I am the joke. Do you know what I mean? Everyone just keeps me, <laughs> keeps it real. When you swear, every time you swear, you look across. Are you, is Ellis not a fan of swearing? It was it, the... Well, she just told me the real when I come on this podcast, don't swear, but I don't know, nervous disposition, I think. You, are you happy to talk about her? I mean, she is Absolutely. listening. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, Ellis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested to know what freedom it gave you when you finally came out, because I think that, you know, I, I work a lot in football. Mm -hmm. And we all know there will be very well-known, world-class gay footballers mm -hmm. who just can't enjoy the freedom of life that you can now enjoy. Yeah. Would you mind taking us through the journey of how hard it is for an elite athlete who is in the public eye, even in the modern world in which we live, to, to come out? Yeah. Do you know what's the maddest one? Um, I ran away from it my whole life and... Um, just because of culturally, the era we was at, at like uh, it, we, it wasn't cool, you know. Um, I've really educated myself over the last few years, and everyone around me in terminology and um, vocabulary. And I will one hundred percent admit, when I was younger, I would have gone, "Oh, that's proper gay, that," and 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 that would mean that something was negative. Yeah, and I was. I was brought up and that was the language I was brought mm. up on and it's only as I've got older and grew through this moment and this process that I realised like we need a lot of education about um, how we speak and the language we use because that's what kept me a prisoner, that's what kept me hidden and not probably feeling, not obviously that one statement but just the way in which the language was used made me scared to be who I was and then Imagine living behind the mask of everything that happened to me as a kid and having to, to hide that trauma. You're then also hiding this. And MMA saved my life in many different ways. It's also absolutely nearly killed me as well. But it provided me the space. I always say MMA and the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu culture and the MMA culture of, like, everything's cool, everything's OK. Um, you are accepted. Um ethnicity, religion and sexuality doesn't matter. Once you cross that mat, you cut, you handshake and you go and it's cool, do you know what I mean? So that provided me the space. Um, I don't feel as if any relationship I've ever been in other than the one I'm in now has provided me freedom to be free in the relationship and in my career. I feel like every relationship I have been in, I would say that person would have always been the A-side in terms of notoriety or where they was in their career because they would always have been athletes. And then this is the first time I've met someone and upon the first time that we met, she's had like 30 questions written out on a phone of all different questions, some stuff I've like never what? been asked. I can't even remember. I'm going to have to see if she, she'll still have them on a the phone, but just things like how does training impact your life? Um, right. she this was is like, the first time Ellis clearly had big plans for you two staying together for I, I like this <laughs> yeah. I know well when we, when we what met what are your thoughts on marriage what are your yeah. thoughts on children how <laughs> no, old do you want to be when me. you retire that was a bit great that to me. ask those questions no yeah. no but the thing was I think Ellis if you can hear us bring the phone in we need yeah. to see these questions yeah. um, I think the thing was she'd never met anyone in my world she comes from football so um, being a head of player care her job is to manage yeah players and I think to be honest it was more a help and an insight to the players also do you know what I mean and maybe she could get a bit of advice off me but I think in that moment Molly McCann the overshare just like spilled a lot of stuff do you know what I mean but I do think in that moment I was a bit like blown away at the fact that someone actually cared well 
Was but, this your first same-sex relationship as no, well? No, no, I've no, had a couple. Right. I've okay. had a couple before, Ellis. Um, sorry, Ellis. But um, I think, like, when you're talking about coming out, there's a level of coming out to your friends and your family. Okay. Like, I couldn't even do it. I was that nervous. I said, Mum, you've got to ring everyone and tell everyone because wow. I felt a deep-rooted negative attachment to my sexuality and I've, like, it made... Growing up how I did, and it's not by the people around me, it's by the culture that we grew up in as as a nation, I believe, not just as my family. Dirty. Like, it it was bad news. Like, you just, oh, oh they're gay. Oh, look, two men kissing. What? Yeah. Oh, my God, look at them women holding hands. Like, that's the stuff you're subject to growing up. And it's also the stuff that people don't understand the impact that has on someone oh, absolutely. who is unable to come out. I mean, you know, there was a famous professional footballer who came out and said the reason why I was unable to do it is because of the throwaway remarks in the dressing room using language about gay or queer as a negative yeah. that meant he, he felt he could never tell the other players that he was gay. And I, I think people don't see it and it's, it's important we have this conversation that yeah. these words well, impact a, people. Do you see that documentary about George Michael and being outed by the media? In, yeah. And this was 98, so you'd have been yeah. eight years of age and it was like... The shame, it was yeah. all, is, is, is being gay was, the word yeah, shame they, was often attached to it. They had a, they had a rough it. narrative with him as well. They was just trying to expose him, expose him, expose him. And what people don't understand is gay persons shouldn't feel the need to come out, yet they still do. And um, and that process is probably the hardest, most nerve-wracking thing because sure. if you receive it in a negative light, that stays with you then forever. Do you know what I mean? But like I say, there's a level of coming out like Ellis was out, but then obviously when she got with me, it's like nationwide out. It's yeah, like like we got engaged on New Year, and half an hour after putting the post online, it's in the Daily Echo in Liverpool. It's all over the MMA um, publications, media publications, and I sat there and she sat there, and this is probably a bit of the negative stigma that we've had to face over like over the years growing up. We both sat there and should have been absolutely ball and loving life, which we was, but we sat there and I remember going like that and I was like, oh, I'm just not ready for the negative that's about to come because I probably struggle more. I, I went for a big period of being absolutely fine with being gay and now I think if I have to speak about it sometimes because I'm a lot more well-known, it gets... Pardon me, it gets scary because you think, mm. oh, I've got to deal with like some idiot from the arse end of nowhere wanting to give me the interpretation of the Bible or the Quran and they're going to throw all this <laughs> stuff at me and I'm just not here for it today. Do you know what I mean? I'm not here for it. So what age were you when you did come out to your when mom? I, when I physically, my mum came out for me, <laughs> I was yeah. 25. Which is it's it's quite late, late yeah. Is that it right? was like I was, I wouldn't even say like, but what age do you think you knew what your sexuality was? 25. I ran from it. Like, right. I had experiences at university uh, with a girl. I was like, oh, um, I know this is not for me. And um, and it wasn't. I, I just wasn't comfortable in myself. I had so much shit going on that I just weren't cool. Do you know what I mean? So it's took a lot of, like... A lot of work for me to sit here and be able to do speak like this on such a broad. I remember about two years ago, I think I done my first come out piece for like Joe Disney Plus, um, all these. Like I had to come to London and near from the UFC picked me up, and I remember I was dropped off at the train station. I was getting picked up at a car. And I remember I had to go and drink. I mean, I didn't have to. I chose to go and drink two pints of Guinness because I was like this because telling your truth and being vulnerable is so scary. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But being gay is a great thing and like our community is like a wonderful thing. And for my birthday this year, me and Ellis went to the Stonewall Inn, which is like by chance it was to be honest but there was a cabaret show on and we was in New York to watch Katie Taylor fight and um in the MSG and uh, we went and watched this cabaret show and I was like how amazing is this like we are where the riots started where where um the gay riots started this is where gay pride started and we got to educate ourselves on our history which was cool 
Oh, here's the oh. phone. Come on then, give us a few. Oh which God. which one sort of leaps out? Or which two or three leap out? Is it genetically difficult for you to have a six pack or easy? <laughs> Is that the first one? <laughs> yeah. Go well, on, Jay, what would you say to <laughs> Genetically <that>? difficult. <laughs> yeah, that's because of my Irish heritage. We don't really have Is six that because pack. she's a big fan of six packs? Oh, that... yeah. Um, <laughs> if someone said, what was your job, what would you say? And a lot, of, a lot of the time, if someone doesn't know who I am, I just say a personal trainer because it opens up the whole, oh, women in sport. So yeah. if I haven't got it in me to fight that day, <laughs> then I don't. What are the flaws in the UFC? What one thing would you change about your journey? Do sport, sport and politics go hand in hand? This is before she even knew I was into politics. And you're saying her mum's nosy. Alice is this is like a question to me. Yeah. <laughs> Alice, what? do you want to come and host the podcast? <laughs> oh my God, are you ready for this one? Go on. <laughs> do you get attached quickly? I'd only met the game for it. Do you know what? I went to an Everton football game and um, I took one of my lad, uh, a little lad from the gym to his first game and I sat next to her and um, that's how we met. It was like by accident, right. by fate, right. to be fair, yeah. And what was your answer to that one? Do you get attached quickly? Oh, I think I probably ordered a drink or something. Did I even answer it? But what would you answer now, though? Now, no. Um, then I when I met it like fame just kicked in for me do you know what I mean yeah. and I couldn't believe everyone wanted to be my friends and I couldn't believe I'd walk into every single like I'd walk down roads and Liverpool bars was open for me ale would be thrust at me I was the queen of the city yep. and I just couldn't believe it and I was like oh my god and it made me feel elated it, like absolutely amazing do you know what I mean but you're the girl from Norris Green that was that, yeah. looking for a place I was one of them do you know what I mean and I've made it and not much has changed in the city by the way um, I feel like well anyone who needs a voice I, I am kind of the voice for them sometimes and I'm just they, they, they love me but how do you say no these days okay so my biggest lesson that I learned last year was no and it's it's painful to say no so to knock a fan back so I have to understand the people who are costing me my inner peace are people running after, running after me chasing me to sign merchandise for pictures when I have to weigh this option up and I have to do it on the spot is this person asking for a picture for Instagram and for their own valid, validation for their self worth or does this picture really like Molly McCann it, does this person really like Molly McCann and I have to decide in that moment which one they are and if it's this one sorry I haven't got time have a good day and if it's this one then it really hurts to say no if I haven't got time or if I'm not in the mental capacity to hold that space for that person because I don't want someone to meet me and have a rubbish experience I've met my I've met my eyes all before and that they was everything I ever imagined them to be. Who was that? Katie Taylor. And I was blown away by that moment. Do you know what I mean? So I have to weigh that up. And also, even in terms of career path, like I'm involved in coaching the national team for the uh, amateur, amateur squad and for weapons down, gloves up. I'm on the board of directors. And I've had to sit them down two weeks ago and say, I'm just going to just put my gloves up for a little bit on these because what's really important for me is I've given you everything that I can right now and I'm going to go into camp and I'm going to go and be the best Molly McCann that I can be. And if I can't be the best Molly McCann that I can be, then I don't bear any weight in these organisations, then I can't keep hitting the people I need to hit and knocking on doors and breaking the doors down that I need to. So I'm going to have to step away for a bit. And I mean, I cried my eyes out on that phone call and the people like, well, we'll see you in a few months, you know what I mean? But I might not be back now because I don't know if I can sustain being the athlete. I'm trying to do it all. Socialist, activist, um, coach, like like leader of like my community and raise the bar and raise the standards and I'm trying to do all of that whilst still trying to understand Molly McCann, understand this and be um be the meatball. Do you know what I mean? It's like a lot of stuff that I'm I'm learning to juggle but I don't know. Ellis said to me, I'm I'm getting really good at my boundaries now and just understanding the biggest thing I've learned from me breakdowns or um so someone said to me, "It's not actually a breakdown; it's like a rebirth." Right? Do you know what I mean? So it's like, a break up. 
<laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, you're finding yourself again because the universe and your body, if you don't stop, the universe and the body will make you stop and it will bring you to your knees, make you surrender. You can shed all of that stuff, work through the stuff and then go again. So what I've realised is I must, when I feel like I'm becoming erratic, when I'm not happy, the moments when waking up on a Monday morning, my best moment of the week would be a Sunday morning walk along the dock with Ellis and the dog docks, it, Ellis and the dogs on the dock, or be a Monday going to the gym because I've had two days off and I can't wait to get back in there. If those two moments aren't making me happy, I need to reassess. I've got too much going on and I just need to stop and slow down. You know what? There's real parallels there when we sat down with Tyson Fury mm -hmm. and some of your story. Um, resonates on in terms of what he told us around this idea of not being able to escape the mask of who of the gypsy king versus being the dad and mm -hmm. the husband that he really is and he told us didn't he that going to the tip is what grounds him after a big <laughs> fight you yeah. might have boxed at Wembley you've had mm -hmm. 80,000 people cheering you on the Saturday night Monday morning and he said I'm, you'll find me at the dump mm -hmm. taking stuff and yeah. doing things like that because that's exactly what brings him back down to to earth and yeah. the person that he that he should be. Yeah, I feel like it's not real life. Like <clears throat> I don't understand why people go off their heads when they they meet me sometimes, and I'm like, I only fight. Like I, I get paid to literally have a fight. Like people go to prison for that when they don't get paid on a weekend <laughs> outside the pub. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, it it blows me wa me mind. But it's took me. I feel like. The fundamentals of Molly McCann is what I wanted as a child. Now I'm in the position to buy them and and achieve them. That is all I want and that is my happiness. And I'm really thankful that I've got I've made a full circle and I found me like is it called Yugi or whatever it's called. But like I found my essence. I understand really what makes me tick and what makes me work. And it's been really hard. The meatball is the person that you see at the weigh-ins feeds from the crowd, fights for the crowd, fights for the person, fights for the underdog, fights for everyone who's not got it easy and needs something to cheer for and needs some excitement and needs someone to know that they're fighting for them. That is what Meatball is, do you know what I mean? And then I really like doing stuff like this because this is Molly McCann and there is people will never know the layers to me and I feel... I'm very much naked in terms of how open I am to use right now, but not everyone deserves this level of Molly McCann. And I think Ellis has really taught me that, like, there's layers to how much I can give mm. to someone. And most people now only deserve, like, the elbow, we'll call it, like, get back, you can stay there. <laughs> you're good with your elbow, we've seen that. Yeah, <laughs> this one especially, but yeah. Um, can okay. I just say thank you very much no problem, for boys. sharing it with us. Um, We've got some quick fire questions for you, as we always do. Before mm -hmm. we get there, my final question is how you feel about being this vulnerable while still competing. You know, we get a lot of athletes that come to us after the careers are over and go, yeah, now I can tell you the truth. Yeah. How, how does this work for you? Because you're going to be back in the ring before too long, probably. Mm -hmm. And no doubt your opponent may well listen to this. So it, it's an interesting dynamic, that, isn't it? I suppose weakness is in the eye of the beholder. Um, the most bravest thing is to tell your truth and be your true authentic self and I've put this out there quite a lot of the time I, I, 10 years ago last month I walked into an MMA gym and I kind of said to, to the people like always be I will always be unapologetically me and that gets me the most hate in the world but I'm not asked because I am happy and I'm being my true honest self. And if people think that that's a negative and if people think that that's wrong, then they're still very archaic and they need to move with the times. And if we're trying to break stigma and if we're trying to make people feel better within themselves for being honest about their truth, then I need to be someone who... I take the hit a lot. My energy levels, my self-esteem and my being takes the hit and takes a bather and do and stuff like this. Like this will absolutely do me in for a day or two. Like I'll go home and I'll feel low because I've really opened myself up to use and probably on the train I'll be thinking, oh my God, how many people are going to listen to that and all that. But then ultimately it's irrelevant because if I'm here to 
to be a trailblazer, to elevate the sport and to be a bit more mainstream and show MMA fighters and UFC fighters for what we really really are. We're real people who probably go through the worst, hardest times and are just trying to share those moments with you. So just be true to you. And can I ask you one last question on top of that? No. Sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, <fine. laughs> like, You're in the most brutal of sports. Mm -hmm. When will you know it's the time to get out and go and pursue a different path? My, the second, if I can't win a belt, like the only people who have beat me in this sport have fought for the world title or are just about to fight for the world title. So I am there and there about, if I've got about six fights left in the UFC, if if I touch the belt, then once I've won it, it'll be going, oh, that's me done, thank you very much. And if I don't think I'm going to touch the belt... That is me done. Thank you very much. And I will, my my last goal as in an athletic career is to win a belt in boxing and is to retire in the MS Bank in Liverpool. Same place I won my MMA world title. It'll be the same place I win my boxing world title. So when that's done, I give myself a couple of fights in the, in the, in the ring. I always call it a cage back stand. In the ring, and then I'll be done. But I need to pop some kids out and enjoy that part of life. For Great. amazing, manifest yeah. that. Manifest oh, don't worry, that. it's in this. I thought journal, it might yeah. be. It'll be journaled. Yeah. Right. Final thing. Quick fire questions. Come on, then. The three non-negotiables that you and the people around you need to buy into, ideally. To know yes, men. To only the truth. To a positive work environment and a positive attitude always, and never give up mentality if it doesn't compromise your mental health. What's your greatest strength and your biggest weakness? I've never thought of this one before. I've never met someone more resilient than me in my life, maybe other than my mum. And my biggest weakness, just wanting to be loved, I suppose. There was a time when I'd accept any form of love, even if it was rejection and hate. And I'm now learning that. Well, I'm not a seat at the table, I'm the fucking table, do you know what I mean? So I'm, get, I'm getting there, but I think that's still probably my weakness, yeah. With that in mind, actually, what would you say to a young Molly McCann if you had the chance to pass on a piece of wisdom to her that you've picked up? People's opinions of you is none of your business and don't feel like your truth needs to be heard by everyone else. Your truth only needs to be heard by you. How important is legacy to you? It wasn't a thing, but I feel as if when someone becomes older and the I never sit and smell the roses, but as I've got older and I look back at what I've done, it's one hell of a ride. And I think that my legacy, if I retired now, is so much more than what 99% of the population could ever achieve. So I'm all good with that. But it is important for me to make sure that I keep on breaking doors in and the legacy keeps getting bigger and better so that others, the road isn't as bumpy for everyone else to try and get, get through. And your one golden rule for living a high performance life, your final message for people who've listened to this conversation? Show up every day. That's all that's asked. Just show up. Really nice. Thank you so much. It's kind of full circle because... On the 10th anniversary of the day I walked into the gym, I signed my 10th bout agreement in the UFC and I confirmed to come on this show. So for me, there's a, I always go in alignment and I feel I'm very aligned and it's amazing. Like, I always downplay myself and like I say, the imposter syndrome comes in. So when you guys asked, I was like, oh, why me? And then Ellis went, go and own it and remember who you are. And then I thought, I've actually probably got a better story than most people. Like, when it comes from bringing yourself up and coming through and really facing not just a bit of adversity, but at every stage of my life and my career, I've done to grow through it. So I feel like I've owned it today. So thank you very much. You've been brilliant. Cheers, you boys. definitely owned it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick one to say thank you so much for watching this content on the High Performance channel. We would love it if you would subscribe. You know, most people that watch what we do don't subscribe. If you can subscribe, we can make this bigger, better, bolder than we've ever done before. So hit subscribe right now and help the High Performance podcast make a real difference to the world. See you soon.